and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session. Foreign Affairs with Future Leaders is a series of youth-led discussions which analyze various international issues and topics by collaboratively addressing their most critical questions. And as I mentioned, they're co-hosted by the Oneir Institute and the Delta Phi Epsilon Professional Foreign Service Fraternity and Sorority at GWU. My name is Elad Raymond, and I am the founder and executive director of the Oneir Institute. And I'm joined today by my co-host and my co-founder, Andrew Ma from uh, Williams College, and he will be our speaker today. Andrew Ma is co-founder and executive director of the Oneir Institute and a class of 1960 scholar in political science at Williams College. A native of Seattle, Washington, he is majoring in political science and concentrating in international relations, American foreign policy, justice and law studies, and science and technology studies. He briefly studied international law at Utrecht University and presented his research on Russian Arctic claims to the Royal Dutch Navy at The Hague. After graduation, he wishes to pursue a career in international law. Thank you to everyone who helped make this event possible, and I can't wait to get started. Before we get going, I'm going to uh, give you some procedural information. So first, as always, please show respect for all peers and all topics discussed. Make sure to challenge yourself to keep an open mind. Please approach the materials professionally and analytically, and be sure to keep your answers uh, and, and questions pertinent to the discussion at hand. If you'd like to speak, please go ahead and raise your hand using the participants feature at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you keep your mic muted unless it's your turn to speak. And when you do speak, we'd love it if you could share your name and where you're calling in from. And we also just wanna note that we'll be recording this event so that we can share our discussion with uh, other people who have been unable to attend and would like to view it later. So without further ado, why don't we go ahead and get started. As SpaceX announces, it will bring Tom Cruise to space for a movie and humanity contemplates the possibility of life on Mars. The vast majority of the oceans remain unexplored. In fact, more people have set foot on the moon than have reached the bottom of the ocean. In this event, we will first discuss the fundamentals of international law and the law of the sea through an examination of some of the key parts of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. We will then analyze how these pertain to some of the most pressing political issues of our time and point out some future issues that deserve more attention. And with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Andrew Ma and uh, ask him if he would uh, ask him if he'd like to get started with us. Andrew? Yeah, uh, I'm ready to get started. I'm very happy to see everyone come out today for this event. I'm very happy to talk about Law of the Sea. It's one of my favorite topics and I think it's one that is very interesting. All right, so if we get started, um, so first, a couple of words generally just about the law of the sea. Um, it impacts us in a lot of ways, definitely more so than people realize, and sometimes in very unsuspected ways. Um, and I'll be getting to some of those unsuspected ways um, later in the event today. So if any of you have tried to follow international issues such as the South China Sea dispute, you've probably run into a lot of you know, legal complexities relating to how the law of the sea functions. Um, and you have probably run into a large convention called the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, otherwise known as UNCLOS. Um, UNCLOS is the core of the law of the sea. And I'll try to go over some of the key elements of UNCLOS that are necessary to understand maritime issues, but it will by no means be an exhaustive overview. So if you have any further questions, you can feel to try to reach out to me. Um, and you know, I'll be happy to try to work with you and answer any of your questions. So the first thing we're gonna talk about today uh, are maritime zones, the different maritime zones defined in UNCLOS. So um, if you can all see, we have a chart up here and there's a lot of different zones and information here, probably too much to digest all at once. So I'm only gonna get to three things. And these things are territorial sea, exclusive economic zone, and the high seas. Understanding the difference between these three zones is basically the, the, the building block to understand all of these different maritime issues. So first we have the territorial sea. On the left, it's considered a part of each state's territorial sovereignty, right? So you can consider this an extension of the land territory that a state possesses. Um, then we have the exclusive economic zone to the right of the territorial sea in this diagram. Um, and this is basically an area where states have an exclusive right for exploitation of resources, exploration, conservation of marine life, etc. Um, 
So it's not within their sovereign territorial sea, but it is still um, within their right for exploitation of resources, which is really important for many states. And then we have the high seas, uh, which is beyond national jurisdiction. No state um, has these parts of the oceans within their sovereignty, nor can they really exploit resources here. Um, if you observe this diagram closely, you might realize that to the left of the territorial sea, there is no specification of exactly what type of territory that is. What I mean by that is that on the left, that could be the beach um, on the mainland of a continent. It could also be an island. Um, it could be any form of territory that is entitled to generate a territorial sea and exclusive economic zone. So given these zones, one goal of states is to claim that an island is part of their territory and therefore it you know, generates an exclusive economic zone and they can use that economic zone for their own benefit. Um, this is something that China has done in the South China Sea um, that frankly a lot of states do because it's, you know, a, a very beneficial move for them on the international stage. It gives, it allows them to expand their maritime territory, allows them access to more resources, maybe potentially, you know, puts an important sea lane in their own uh, territorial sea or exclusive economic zone. So there, there are many reasons to do so. Um, and with that out of the way, we have to talk about what an island is. So at first glance, you might think islands seem like a very common sense type of thing. If you look at a map, you can usually tell if something is an island or not. For instance, Florida is connected to the rest of North America by land, so it's not an island. Cuba is surrounded by water, so it is an island. When it comes to the legal definition under UNCLOS, most instances are also pretty self-explanatory. However, it's still very important to examine the definition for the sake of the few ambiguous cases that cause issues for people. If you follow the South China Sea dispute, you might be aware of a lot of different contentious cases with regard to the definition of an island, but I'm gonna bring up my own very odd example to showcase why the definition of an island matters and why it is important to you know, consider it critically and think about what it means. So as you can see on the screen, we have a a map of Canada, and there's an island outlined in red that I'm assuming no one has ever thought too seriously about. This is Devon Island, uh, an uninhabited island, actually the largest uninhabited island in the world. It's about the same size as uh, Croatia, the country of Croatia, but there's uh, no one on it anymore. Uh, in the uh, 1930s, there were a bunch of uh, Inuit families living on the island, and after the collapse of fur prices, um, they left, uh, and the island is very inhospitable. It has high wind, uh, extremely cold climate, um, and it, it was considered, you know, not a very nice place to live for a variety of reasons. So, yes, it looks like on the map it's an island, but is it really an island? Well, we have to examine the definition provided for us in the law of the sea to, to really determine whether it is an island. So with that, let's take a look. So uh, I've just cut out the section from the convention itself, Article 121, uh, known as the regime of islands. So there are three paragraphs on what an island is. The first paragraph gives us three requirements for islands. Uh, it states that they have to be naturally formed, which means that they have to be totally composed of natural terrain. Man-made structures do not count. Um, so you can't, you know, dump a bunch of sand or concrete into the ocean and call it an island. That doesn't count. You also can't find some, you know, feature in the ocean and put a bunch of concrete on it to make it into an island. Those don't count as islands. It has to be also surrounded by water, obviously, and above water at high tide. So if something's only visible when the water recedes, it's also not considered an island. It must be visible at the highest point of the water. So if we look at this definition, think about Devon Island again, there's an interesting thing in the third paragraph here. It says, rocks which cannot sustain human habitation or economic life of their own shall have no exclusive economic zone or continental shelf. So here we run to the distinction between rocks and islands. And this is a tension that you will see throughout many of the important maritime issues, especially in the South China Sea, the distinction between what is a rock and what is an island. In the second paragraph of this article, it says that, it basically explains that 
if something is an island, it's entitled to all the, the maritime zones that we looked at. But if it's a rock, it's not. And as we see in the third paragraph, if some feature can't sustain human habitation or economic life on its own, then it's a rock, and thus it's not entitled to these things. So Devon Island. It was once inhabited by the Inuit people, and they were engaged in the fur trade there all on their own, no outside you know, factors propping up their economic activity. So yeah, it's surrounded by water, it's naturally formed, it's above water at high tide, so it's an island. But these people who are arguably some of the most suited people on earth to live in this area, if they left the area <clears throat> deeming it inhospitable or you know, beyond what is worth it to sustain habitation there, then is Devon Island, despite how large it is, the size of Croatia, is it an island? Should it be considered a rock? I can't really answer these questions for you. I'm not qualified to do so, but these, it's just an interesting way of thinking about how we should, we should consider the definition of islands and how murky it can be. Um, this case, if you ask most legal scholars, will still be rather clean cut, but you'll see when we get into more cases on the South China Sea and such, that perhaps uh, it can get even more murky than this. So beyond islands, uh, let's talk a little bit about exclusive economic zones and about the other maritime zones and how they're drawn exactly, uh, because it's different for different states. Uh, if we can go to the example about the Philippines. <clears throat> so if you remember in the first diagram with maritime zones, uh, you, you saw that first there's the country's territory, the land territory of some sort, and then it has a territorial sea, and then exclusive economic zone, and so on and so forth. But if you look at this map of the Philippines, you'll notice that it looks like there's parts of their economic zone and part of uh, you know, their, their, their maritime zones that don't exactly follow uh, the territory of their, their islands very closely. And this is because uh, the Philippines is known as an archipelagic state, um, and they're entitled to different uh, maritime zone drawing schemes, basically. Uh, so instead of, you know, rigor, if, if you imagine you're a cartographer, you're sitting down at your desk with a map of the Philippines, you're not taking your pencil and rigorously tracing a line around every single island of the Philippines. Groups of islands are considered an entire entity, and thus the lines are drawn that way. Uh, for many reasons, probably the most feast, like the most practical of which is that it saves us a lot of time and it makes more sense than to try to, you know, delineate every single tiny little zone. Um, so yes, archipelagic states make the drawing of these maritime zones more complicated. The important part to understand is that their zones cannot be drawn in such a way that they cut off the access of other states to their rightful maritime zones. So if you can see here, uh, the Philippines uh, to the southwest, it has, uh, you know, the line sort of juts out a little bit. Um, but it stops when it gets to the border uh, with uh, Malaysia and Indonesia on the island of Borneo, um, so as to not interfere with um, other maritime zones. So with that, we can actually get into the South China Sea dispute, which you can actually see a little bit on this map. Uh, we, can, we can look at an overview of the South China Sea dispute and think about how some of these things we just talked about apply to it. So um, in the South China Sea dispute, China claims that uh, all of the features in the South China Sea, including the Spratly Islands, which you can see on this map, belong to China. And they basically base this off of historical claims from the Ming Dynasty. They outline all of the maritime territory that they consider their own in the nine dash line, which is the, the red line that you can see on the, on the screen right now. Uh, the Philippines has a counter argument against this in that they claim that the nine dash line fundamentally violates provisions of uh, UNCLOS. And it claims that the features in the South China Sea, including most of the Spratly Islands, cannot sustain life of their own. And thus, they are rocks and not islands. Uh, and as we learned, rocks are not entitled to an exclusive economic zone nor a continental shelf. Therefore, China's claims and exploitation of features in the South China Sea are illegitimate. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, uh, for something to be an island, it has to be above water at high tide. It has to be fully surrounded by water. And it has to be naturally formed. So if you were following the issue a couple of years ago, you might have seen those reports of China manually building up the features to make them into things that would be always above waters, et cetera, to you know, meet the definition. 
those don't count. Those don't count at all. That, that's blatant disregard for what UNCLOS says. Um, so we have, we have this issue here. We have this dispute between China and the Philippines, and frankly, many of the other states. As, as you can see, Vietnam is also you know, affected by the nine dash line. Malaysia is. Um, if you see, there's a little rectangle extending out from Malaysia, that's Brunei's claim. So there's a lot of parties involved in this dispute. Um, and the core problem comes down to really, one, are China's claims legitimate at all? And two, are the features in the South China Seas, you know, each of them individually, are they rocks or islands or exactly where do we fall down on this? Um, this has led to a lot of very interesting uh, mental gymnastics that these states have done, right? China has tried to dump sand on features to build them up to make them into islands, which as we've discussed, doesn't work. Um, Vietnam has once tried a very interesting approach um, in order to prove that certain features could sustain economic life of their own. Um, so they have, they have military and na naval bases here, but what they did was they, they brought a bunch of monks, I believe, uh, a couple of monks at least, to these features to prove that they could sustain human habitation and economic life, which was a very interesting approach and such that motivated other countries to try similar mental gymnastics and justify various ways of claiming that these features are islands. But I digress. Um, so now we have this dispute. We have to talk about how do we resolve the dispute? Um, how do the Philippines and China, or just states in general, come to a resolution on various disputes that they have in Law of the Sea? So now we have to talk about Article 287, the choice of procedure. So when a state signs UNCLOS, it's allowed to choose one of four, or it can choose multiple of them, of course, multiple options here. Um, to resolve disputes. So we have A, uh, an international tribunal for the law of the sea. The, the ICJ is the next option, the International Court of Justice. We have an Annex 7 arbitral tribunal uh, and an Annex 8 special arbitral tribunal. So those are the four choices. Uh, China made no choice when it signed, ratified. It, it made absolutely no indication that it was going to abide by any of these. It made no declaration that it, it would go through with any arbitration. The Philippines didn't specify any single one, but said that it would be open to the options that it, it would you know, abide by them and such. So what happened was the Philippines brought the case against China at the Permanent Court of Arbitration through the Annex 7 tribunal option, which is C here. Um, and China declared it would not participate in the arbitration as it believed the case brought against it by the Philippines was a question of state sovereignty rather than interpretation or clarification of maritime laws under UNCLOS. So an important thing to note, the arbitral tribunal only has the power to clarify issues um, or interpret UNCLOS. It doesn't have the jurisdiction to delineate issues of national sovereignty. It doesn't have the power to draw a line and say, this belongs to this country, this belongs to this country, right? It can only, rule on what is in UNCLOS already. So based on that, China claimed that the case that the Philippines was bringing against it was a question of sovereignty. It's not an interpretation of UNCLOS. Furthermore, China also claimed that it had already made agreements with the Philippines um, bilaterally through, the, uh, through other multilateral organizations to resolve disputes through bilateral negotiations. Uh, so it felt that it was unnecessary to go through with arbitration. Furthermore, it also pointed out that many of these islands, uh, they said that they did not find the prior Philipp the Philippines claims to them to be uh, clearly communicated to them. And thus they thought that there was no dispute on some of these features. Um, so for these reasons, it said that it would not participate in the arbitration. Um, so it is true that the arbitral tribunal is not supposed to have jurisdiction over issues of state sovereignty and whether this really is that sort of question, I I'll leave up to you. It's sort of something that, you know, will take us down really far down the rabbit hole. Um, and I'll just explain the result is that, first of all, the permanent court of arbitration did find that it had the jurisdiction to clarify the status of the features, almost all of which it determined were rocks, um, or they were uh, visible, you know, some features are visible above the water only at low tide. So according to this, that means that China is not entitled to exploitation rights um in the waters adjacent to these features right so this was a, a big win for the philippines 
Um, China ignored the award, of course. Um, and probably a little known thing about the way this um, arbitration actually went, since China refused to participate, the only way for them to actually finish this uh, arbitration was they looked at uh, a previous white paper publishing China's position on the South China Sea dispute with regard to these islands and rocks. And they basically like, they almost did like a mock court type of thing where they basically had to simulate you know, what would the Chinese side think about this issue, et cetera, right? So it was a very strange case. Um, and so, you know, uh, one, one opinion that people might have is that maybe the court had jurisdiction to hear the case, but, you know, the result of how they did it really sort of undercuts its value. So, okay, what happens now? Assuming the dispute is not resolved because China is ignoring uh, the award, can China actually close off the South China Sea? Would they even want to? Um, that sort of thing. So it turns out under UNCLOS, there's a thing called right of innocent passage, which basically states that uh, your territorial sea and exclusive economic zone, other states can pass through so long as the passage is not you know, threatening, it's not of a military nature, it's innocent passage that they communicate with you clearly. So for instance, you know, if, if a state has a, a piece of, um, you know, territorial sea that other states need to pass through in order to, you know, conduct their trade, if they communicate with them, hey, we're going to pass through your territory for this purpose, you know, we have this stuff on board, whatever, they can pass. It's fine. They are allowed to do so. So in that sense, it's not the biggest deal uh, necessarily that China is not complying. What's more of an issue, though, um, is, is twofold. One, under UNCLOS, States do have the right um, to close parts of their territorial sea, uh, depending on if they find that there's issues of national security, et cetera, that they, you know, they, they can have legitimate reason to close them. And perhaps the, the, the larger issue than just that is that, you know, who, who knows if China really in the long term will care much about UNCLOS anymore. Um, they, they might just decide, you know, we'll try to close off this as much as possible. That we don't know exactly. Um, a lot of people think that it's not really in China's best interest to close off the South China Sea, considering you know a lot of their trade goes through it as well. Really, you know, they are concerned of this area mostly because it gives them um, an outlet to the ocean. It, you know, for very strategic reasons, it's important, um, but it, it's unclear. So, uh, speaking of things that are unclear, uh, I'll talk a little bit about future frontiers. Um, so, the law of the sea doesn't appear at first to have much to do with things like outer space and cyberspace and you know these very bizarre things but it really does and i'll start from something a little more concrete and that's deep sea mining uh, so i have this we have this diagram up here um, of a ship basically drilling in uh, to the seabed uh, for natural resources so this is something that has been uh, considered for many years i think from as early as the 60s and 70s um, people have had an interest in doing this um, and this is something that really might be coming to fruition rather soon. Um, the exploitation of all these natural resources um, it is really, really a, a large development for all of humanity and potentially, you know, change the world's economic landscape. Uh, but beyond this, we have um, cyberspace and outer space. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk about cyberspace because I, I think it's very, it, you know, it's, it illustrates why the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is such an interesting convention and why its importance extends far beyond just uh, the maritime boundaries. So right now in cyberspace, there's a debate over whether cyberspace should be open or closed. Rather, should each nation be entitled to, you know, sovereign cyberspaces, right? Should they be entitled to extend their sovereignty into cyberspace? Or should cyberspace be totally open and free of national boundaries? Um, this was once a debate that was had in the law of the sea as well. Uh, you know, there was a, a Dutch legal theorist uh, by the name of Hugo Grotius, who argued that the seas ought to be free, that, you know, uh, in general, states should be free to trade, should be free to conduct business, should be free to pass um, through all the waters on the sea. Um, and then there's another uh, theorist by the name of uh, Selden, uh, a British man, Selden, and he argued that seas are should be closed. They should be part of national sovereignty. Each state should claim parts of the sea that it exercises jurisdiction over and such. Um, and in the end, 
Hugo Grotius's idea of mare liberum, the, the free oceans, won out, although we do retain some of Selden's principles. Um, and so if we look at how the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea was established and the principles are enshrined with it, you can sort of start to see the, the foundations of maybe a framework for how cyberspace should be governed, um, which is something that really might need to uh, be addressed in, in the future, right? And some, same thing can be applied to space um, in the distant future. So, you know, the similar conversations can be had and it, it really uh, illustrates that, you know, UNCLOS is in theory just the convention about the sea, but it really is so much more than that. Um, and it's a very interesting topic that I hope that people will, you know, uh, put some time and energy into uh, looking at. Great. Uh, and, all right. you know, well, that's, that's, all, that's it for, for my spiel. Um, so I'm all good there. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Andrew. It was really, it's really great to hear a little bit of insight into all these complexities of really a, a, an aspect of international law that is so critical because it is so universally recognized because it really just, you know, it shows kind of how international law can, can work in, in some, in some cases. Um, and so with that, I'd love to kind of start picking your brain with a few uh, questions building off of what we've just discussed. Uh, so to get us started, uh, if you could, we spoke a lot about the South China Sea as our case study while we, you know, while discussing the different aspects of UNCLOS and the law of the sea. And while the South China Sea dispute may receive the most attention, it is something of an exceptional case when it comes to maritime dis disputes and its complexity and its different nuances. So. How is the South China Sea case unique from other disputes? And what are some other examples of disputes that we should be monitoring? Mm, that's a good question. Um, it is true, the South China Sea is quite an exceptional case and its importance and such. Um, it's unique from other disputes in that it has an extraordinary number of you know, participants, uh, the Philippines, China, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, all, you know, directly involved. Taiwan, which, you know, can be debated to some extent, that they also have some claims that, you know, they certainly overlap with other claims, but the issue of Taiwanese sovereignty is one that is not really, you know, I'm not really here to answer that today. Um, so there's, there's a lot of um, complexity in the international politics involved there. Um, it also sort of touches on a, a lot of interesting issues as to like, for instance, uh, what do you do when a state is unwilling to go through with arbitration? You know, well, what do you do about a state that is building up these reefs um, artificially to claim their islands, right? What, what do you do when you deal with a, a superpower that refuses to cooperate? So these are all sort of issues that are fundamental to international law, but are, you know, that you see really, they come out through the South China Sea dispute a lot. Um, some other disputes there's the, the ongoing dispute between Greece and Turkey over uh, islands in the Aegean. Um, that's one. Uh, Lebanon and Israel have some maritime disputes going on. Um, there's a lot of ongoing disputes on uh, claims to the Arctic, uh, Russia, the United States and such. Um, there's all sorts of, all sorts of environmental um, issues, of course, as well. That I, I didn't really even get to cover, but you know, there, there, there's so many, there's a wide, wide variety of different maritime disputes, but probably, you know, uh, the two that are, are the most covered in the media, probably the most famous um, outside of the South China Sea have to do with the, the Aegean and, and the East China Sea. All right. And, uh, and, you know, we've been seeing lots in the news about all these, these other cases. So I think that, you know, if the South China Sea is any indication of how complex any of these uh, disputes could get, it's, it's really interesting, it's really important rather to kind of see, draw, draw the connections where they do exist and see how certain other cases could evolve, could continue to evolve, you know, that forward thinking the way that we were discussing with regard to space and cyber can also apply within the bounds of maritime disputes as well. And, you know, as I mentioned, when I was kind of starting off um, this, this questioning period, UNCLOS is really important for international law because as we've mentioned, it's so universally recognized. And interestingly, there are quite a few landlocked signatories, like I think Mongolia, Bolivia has also signed on to it. So why are countries without access to a coastline even involved in this convention? And why is that important? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, if you are a 
an avid uh, connoisseur of trivia, you might know some interesting facts about the Mongolian Navy, which used to exist, but that's not really the reason why they're signed on. Um, so first of all, in, in a very sort of backward way, they don't really have much to lose by signing onto these, considering it doesn't really, it's not applied to them negatively, really. Um, and they have something to gain from it. Um, so among the many things they can gain from it, there's a, a, a provision established in UNCLOS um, regarding deep sea mining that is actually of great interest to countries like Mongolia and Bolivia. So basically how it goes is uh, under UNCLOS, you need a contract to carry out exploitation of the seabed minerals. Um, and there's all sorts of rules and regulations um, set out by the International Seabed Authority, which is a separate you know, organization that, that regulates all these practices. Um, and basically, the economic gains from deep seabed mining, um, basically, the, the states that have a contract to do so, the more economically developed states, you know, in basically all cases, uh, will then pay royalties to the International Seabed Authority. Uh, and the economic benefits are to be, uh, I think, as they say it, shared for the benefit of mankind as a whole, which is basically a, a way of saying the economic benefits will be paid out to developing countries that lack the technology and the resources to carry out their own seabed mining, um, which is especially a big deal for a country like Mongolia or Bolivia, right? Because without a coastline, even if they had the technology, it, it would sort of be a bit of a far stretch for them to, to do this without involvement of other countries. But specifically, um, you know, if you participate um, in UNCLOS and you're involved with the International Seabed Authority, you could potentially reap the rewards of you know, some of these things, right? So it, it's something that they can look forward to there. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, they, they're not really negatively impacted by it too much. Um, and you know, there's a lot of principles here that um, a state might stand for in terms of what they believe is right for the governance of the oceans that might apply to other spheres as well. So, you know, they, they totally can gain something by, by being a part. Yeah, absolutely. With the application to, to other areas. Um, and, you know, just as there are countries that maybe it's confusing as to why they are a part of it, there are also con some countries uh, who are notable players on the international stage who actually are not a uh, party to, to UNCLOS. I mean, it's critical to note that the United States is actually not a party to UNCLOS. So could you explain to what extent the U.S. is actually involved in the convention currently and why it doesn't really play a more active role? Yeah, so um, the United States was actually very involved with the process of creating and drafting UNCLOS, um, but it's, uh, it, it's not a party to it um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the first is that uh, the United States is a superpower um, and it believes itself to be, in a lot of cases, sort of above international law, particularly when it comes to UNCLOS. Uh, from a pragmatic standpoint, it doesn't really think that being a part of UNCLOS would, would really help its advance its interests very much. Um, you know, if the United States accedes to the convention, uh, it's going to be the target of climate change lawsuits, environmental action lawsuits by everyone that wants to bring cases against them. You know, uh, it will basically open the door for a bunch of politically motivated lawsuits, or you could, you don't even have to call them politically motivated lawsuits. They might just be, you know, justified lawsuits. Um, the United States also sort of believes that it, it's protected its interests reasonably well, uh, without having much to do with the convention directly you know it has a, a powerful navy it can leverage its navy to you know ex, you know pro, how how's it say to project its its influence everywhere um it, it doesn't really feel there's much to gain it, it can access the oil and gas uh in the extended continental shelf in the arctic and the gulf of mexico um without really needing to have to deal much with unclos it just negotiates bilaterally with states or it, it just gets its way. Um, yeah, and so it, it doesn't really think that joining UNCLOS confers any additional rights or benefits that the United States doesn't already have. The, the philosophy of the United States, as far as I see it, is that it has uh, the strength required to not rely on something like this. And instead, it, it just decides to rely on the, the force of its political power and its navy. Yeah, I can, I can certainly understand that, especially also, again, just bring, I keep bringing back how UNCLOS relates to these 
frontiers of the future like cyber like space and i would imagine that that is certainly tied into the american choice not to be more involved uh in this practice because you know this this could apply to other areas where they they do have interest i'd like to ask just one more question of mine before i open up to the audience we'd love to hear any questions that you have on the topic for andrew and that you just like to raise in general but one more question just on this topic of applications to future frontiers what do you think are the most salient challenges to the development of similar international law for cyber or for outer space or for any other frontiers that you can think of? Yeah, so I think the first most obvious uh, issue to the development of a similar international convention for cyber and outer space is that uh, international law as a field moves rather slowly. Um, it takes people quite a bit of time to make developments in this field because it's sort of uh, it, it requires a lot of agreement uh, from different states, a lot of cooperation that it is hard to come by very quickly. Um, but beyond that, uh, you know, cyberspace has a couple of very fundamental questions that we haven't addressed. For instance, you know, open versus closed that I discussed, um, but also, you know, what do we do about different cyber attacks, operations, et cetera, right? Should states be held responsible for them? Um, one of the, the biggest questions is that, in generally, um, there's a prohibition on, on the use of force in the UN Charter, but it allows for, uh, you know, force used in self-defense, right? It allows for proportional uh, self-defense. Should that really be applied to cyberspace or not? How can we apply these existing international laws to cyberspace? Should they be applied? Do we need to write new laws? There are a bunch of these fundamental questions that haven't yet really been answered. Um, so first we would have to answer those questions. Um, to be frank, I, I'm hoping that such a conversation can happen sooner rather than later and that we can start maybe making some international progress on a convention of this sort. Um, and maybe COVID-19 will even help states realize that at this present juncture, uh, you know, regulating cyberspace, cyber operations, these sorts of things uh, have become more important than ever before. Um, but I'm not necessarily too hopeful for them to finish it with uh, any, you know, any type of urgency. Um, there were some government, inter intergovernmental bodies, the UN um, group of governmental experts and open-ended working group that have been dealing with these sorts of issues and thinking about them and having discussions at the highest level between states um, for quite a while, I, I think, you know, well over a decade. Uh, and though they've made some progress, they haven't really gone to the point where they would create um, a comprehensive framework that would cover anything like that. Um, China and Russia and even other states have noted that they would like to make a framework like this in the future. Um, I think China even had a goal to finish it by 2020, which I mean, obviously it looks like it's not happening. Um, but yeah, it's, it's unclear exactly how that sort of thing would work out. And, and cyberspace is, um, you know, definitely, I, I think the next big field that needs to be conquered. Um, and I, I don't have too much expertise on, on outer space, but I imagine that there's similar issues um, involved with outer space, right? Because as of right now, we don't really have nation states claiming parts of outer space or really using outer space as uh, you know, a prime battlefield, if you will. But in the future, there very well may be despite you know, prohibitions on it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that something else to note is that, especially in the case of cyber, it's much harder to define what that space actually is. I know that the Russians have talked a lot about sovereignty with regard to cyberspace, you know, and how that would be even, even be applied. With outer space, I guess I could understand it to some extent more, but there's a lot of theory talking about the outer space being a commons of sorts, right? right. So mm -hmm. I, I just think it's, it's really, really intriguing to see how this could be applied. And also more intriguing for me to think about the fact that, you know, prior to something like Unclos, which is only 1982, like there were a lot of there was a lot of interaction and a lot of war and a lot of things happening on the sea prior to 1982. Uh, but of before course. that, there really was this kind of sense of Wild West uh, to some extent, right? Um, yeah. So, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for your answers to, to my own questions. And now I'd really like to offer the opportunity for other members of the audience to, um, to go ahead and raise their hand or submit a question through the chat. But we'd love, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Uh, and just please be sure to let us know who you are and where you're calling from. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free um, to go ahead and raise your hand. And if you need to keep thinking about them, 
can always keep uh, hitting off mine. Oh, we do have a question, and it's from Greg. Uh, Greg, you can go ahead and unmute and share, who, uh, share introduce yourself, and uh, go ahead and ask. Hey guys, uh, Greg here, calling from Massachusetts. Um, I was wondering, so the the convention says a lot about definitions of on islands, but does it have uh, provisions on definitions of what is a sea, which you know might have implications for things like the Caspian Sea, um, disputes in the uh, Black Sea, and and other bodies of water like that? Um, yes, as far as I'm aware, it, it does. Um, the Caspian Sea would not be regarded as a sea. Um, the Black Sea um, would, it, it, there's maritime zone disputes there as well. Um, Crimea has made things very complicated there, um, certainly. Um, but I'll, I, 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 I very much appreciate this question because it sort of brings up the same point I was trying to bring up with uh, Devon Island. That's something that might appear to be very common sense, very obvious isn't exactly, may, may not exactly be what it seems like, right? Um, there's, we, we have, you know, examples of lakes sort of drying up. We have, you know, Lake Chad, we have the, you know, the RLC, these sorts of things. And it, due to climate change, it's very likely that in the future, our conception of, you know, what area is considered a sea or not, what area is an ocean, that things might really change in the future. Um, so though right now we, we seem to have a much more firm handle on the water aspect of, of the definitions as opposed to the, the land definitions. Um, it's definitely something that we should, you know, keep our eyes open for um, because, I mean, it's very likely that there will be some changes in the future, especially, you know, yeah, the Black Sea is a very good example. Thank you. All right. Uh, Nick, you have a question as well. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey, guys. I'm Nick. I'm calling from uh, D.C. right now, so I'm back in D.C. And my question is for Andrew. Andrew, thanks for presenting today. It was really interesting and I'm happy to be a part of it. What do you think the implications of um, uh, UNCLOS is for airspace? Because we didn't really talk about airspace. And the reason I'm asking is because, you know, it seems it's really dropped out of the news, obviously, since it's been a year. But the Iranian-American crisis back 2019, 2020, where you had Iran bomb oil tankers and then you know, shoot down a U.S. drone. And so I'm curious what the implications are just because we think in the future of warfare, as the United States started been practicing with drone warfare and, you know, drone uh, occupation of airspace, how is that going to change when you have like a, you know, a crisis like that where you had the United States saying we were in international airspace and you had Iran saying, no, you were in our airspace. What can we see and like what might need to, like what uh, statutes and regulations might need to be put in place to regulate that type of uh, sovereignty issue? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so a couple of points on that. So it's sort of been custom. Um, so in international law, there's many sources of international law. The most easy one to point to is treaty law, right? You write down it a, you know, on a piece of paper, you sign it with everyone else, you all agree to it, that's a source of law. Um, you know, but custom, customary international law, that's another type of international law. Um, and so even before 1982, before we signed a, a document that said that, you know, there are these maritime zones and such, um, it was generally understood by states that the, the uh, area above your state, right, the airspace above your state belongs to you. Um, so in, um, in the Law of the Sea Convention, um, it specified explicitly that the, that states, coastal states have sovereignty over the airspace uh, above their territorial seas as well, right? So um, they have sovereignty over the airspace above their territory and above their territorial sea. Um, and so I think I, on the uh, 1958 convention on territorial sea and contiguous zones, it, it basically, it specified this as well. Um, and I think as well, there's a convention on international civil aviation that states that uh, every state has complete and exclusive sovereignty over the airspace above its territory, um, including um, all of its land areas and territorial water. So it's, it's sort of, it's very clear about exactly um, what a state should in theory own um, when it comes to its airspace. Um, and uh, I think it also states that no aircraft, no foreign aircraft may fly over a state's territorial sea without permission of that state. Um, and permission can be granted, I think, um, either, you know, just through asking for permission in the moment or through like a 
bilateral agreement, an international agreement, um, you know, some type of aviation agreement uh, about something of that sort. When it comes to disputes, though, um, I mean, for issues of whether an airplane or a drone or anything was flying over an area that is considered within their, um, you know, within a, a sovereign state's airspace, it's really, if, if the case is, is difficult um, for states to resolve, I, I think mostly it's probably more of a, of a political issue, right? Because um, there's a lot of instances where Though it, it may be that the, the zones are indeed unclear, it's more that there's a lack of political cooperation on this, right? Um, like, like we can take the US and Iran as an example, right? I, I would probably argue that uh, no matter how, uh, you know, a maritime or airspace dispute played out between these two states, they, they wouldn't really be resolved in such a nice and clean way. Um, so yeah, I mean, hopefully we, there, we have more elaborate um, diplomatic mechanisms, I think, are, are the most important thing to resolving these issues um, more so than anything else. If we can have, um, you know, some bilateral discussions, um, maybe there's there's more room. Um, because if we want to pursue a legal solution to this, um, it will be hard considering, you know, the status of the United States and its unwillingness to accept a lot of these uh, international legal decisions and awards and participate in them. Um, and also if we just consider like, you know, the type of state and regime that Iran is. So yeah, it, it's a good question for sure. But I think we just need more, you know, diplomatic efforts as naive as that sounds. Thanks for that, Andrew. And thanks for the question, Nick. Uh, so if anyone else has a question, feel free to raise your hand. In the meantime, I'll go ahead and ask another one of mine. So I was really intrigued by the, uh, the Devon Island example. I mean, I, you know, you wouldn't really think that as far as like, is it an island, is it a rock? And I'm sure there are lots of other interesting cases uh, of this one that comes to mind that I know about is what's called the Russia, the peanut hole uh, in the Eastern, yeah, out in Siberia, where basically they had uh, an area where they, it was surrounded on three sides by Russian territory, but it went farther than 200 nautical miles. So that area in the middle technically isn't Russian territory, even though even though it was within, well within the Russian kind of maritime area, like no legal definition for that, but, but what I'm basically saying, and they ended up getting that. So just Kate, do you have any other cases that you'd like to share with us that are just really interesting when you think about all these kind of technicalities that we discussed in this event? Yeah, um, the peanut hole is a very interesting one, um, for sure. Uh, I, I think uh, in uh, 2013, Russia petitioned, um, the United Nations to declare the peanut hole to be a, a part of their continental shelf and they, they, they were accepted. So um, now it is considered Russian territory. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's a funny case as well. Um, some other instances, there's some, some stuff uh, in the north of Canada again, um, for instance, between Canada and Greenland. I think there's, there's a bunch of different cases. You can, you can look them up on the internet for yourself, but basically they're, the, this, the issues with these are all whether they are, um, you know, visible at high tide or not, right? There's a lot of these like gravel banks that sometimes you might think would be islands and sometimes might not be islands because they're, you know, not really stationary, that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of, you know, cases uh, of dispute there. Not that they're really all that politically important. Uh, same with Devon Island, really. Like it doesn't really matter much to anybody. In, in real life, if Devon Island is an island or a rock. Um, similarly, you know, a lot of these examples, it doesn't matter too much if these gravel, you know, outcroppings or islands or rocks, um, presumably they're, they're mostly rocks, they're not islands. Um, but I mean, they're, they're interesting to consider. So those are, there are a couple more there. Um, there's, there's a lot of individual um, cases in, in the South China Sea and in the Aegean that are interesting. Another um, interesting question a, a legal question that was brought up with the arbitration between the Philippines and China was that uh, if one specific feature is not considered an island, can you consider multiple features in a group to be, uh, you know, constitute an island? So that's another interesting question that people were wondering about. Um, and so, you know, there, there's that. Um, other questions that come up um, are, you know, if you know things about Dutch history and about the way the Dutch lived, they reclaimed a lot of land. Um, 
So, you know, you know, hypothetically, if there's like flooded areas near reclaimed pieces of land, is it man-made? Is it not? Is that an island? So, you know, there's, if you want to, you can do, you can just generate examples in your head um, and you can come up with a lot of interesting ones. But yeah, there, there's tons out. Um, if you're interested in going through those, um, read through some of the ideas in the South China Sea about um, considering groups of features an island. Um, you know, you can look at things uh, written by Dutch people about whether certain things should count as islands within their territory or not. Um, there's Canadian, um, Danish examples through Greenland, Russian ones, there's a lot, definitely. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. And I'll be sure to go check those out because this is really intriguing to me. We have time for one more question and we do have one. So Elizabeth, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and go ahead and ask? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hi, I'm Elizabeth. Uh, I'm in Arlington, Virginia right now. Um, my question is actually about the implications of the UN Convention on the, of the Law of the Sea um, for human rights. I know in 2019, the summer of 2019, um, a woman named Carola Raquette was arrested in Italy for unlawfully docking 55 Libyan refugees. Um, and she was freed because she worked for Sea Watch, which is a German organization that operates under the law of the sea. And basically the judge assert, asserted that she was doing her job by upholding the law of the sea by upholding, I think a part of it that states that if you are at sea and, and like a group of people or a person is in need of assistance, that you have an obligation to assist them and bring them to like a, a dock that is safe. Um, so I was just curious if you're familiar with this case um, and if you could touch a little bit upon like its implications for human rights um, and how the law of the sea is becoming increasingly relevant. Yeah, um, I, I have heard of this case. Um, it is true, yeah, um, the specification about the duty to, to render aid if possible. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, I think, sadly, sort of the environmental and human rights aspects and implications of uh, UNCLOS are sort of the ones getting overlooked because they often, you know, don't carry the same power political, you know, structures and impetuses with them, um, though they're becoming, you know, increasingly more important um, due to the way that global politics is playing out and due to the way that climate change is progressing. Um, I guess I, I have this to say about um, instances like that. Um, first of all, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's intentionally designed um, within the convention that there's, there's some deal of ambiguity, but I, I do think that an interpretation of, you know, the convention to allow um, for this sort of thing for, you know, for aiding other people who are in need is definitely a positive thing. Um, and if possible, um, I, I do think this is an example that should be adopted for uh, any you know, future legal frameworks on, you know, outer space, potentially that sort of thing. Um, in, in terms of, you know, if, if this should have been illegal in the first place or in, in terms of something like that, um, I, I'm not too sure about all the specifics. I suppose a lot of it might have to do with national law as well that I, I'm not too um, familiar with. But yeah, inter internationally, this is definitely, um, I think, something that uh, is it's a good principle to have uh, and something that should be upheld. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I think, um, you know, it, it's good that it happened in such a way that it could have been brought out that the person was doing their job in accordance with, um, with the convention outlined. Otherwise, um, I'm almost certain that, you know, it, it would have been deemed illegal and someone would have been punished for it. Um, otherwise, you know. To put it simply, the law of the sea is a convention that is used by larger, more powerful states when it is expedient for them and otherwise ignored, right? So China is party to it to a certain extent, but you know it takes advantage of it to try to justify its own means, but it doesn't really play by the rules, shall we say. The United States is, you know, similarly not all that, you know, involved with it for completely positive purposes. Same with Russia. Um, so yeah, when you have these very powerful states that have their own agendas, of course, um, human rights and environmental regulations are usually the first to go, yeah. So sadly, that's just the way it is, um, but hopefully something can be done about that. Thanks, Andrew. And, and yeah, I think that this is a really important comment, not only on UNCLOS, but on international law in general, in theory, you know, um, and of course, 
as you know, we've touched on a few times with, with climate change and uh, as one of the biggest drivers of, of change in general to uh, just to, to the world and to global politics, we are going to see that this, the question of human rights, the question of migration is going to intersect with Uncross more and more and more. Um, but with that, that's it for the question period. But what we like to do with our foreign affairs and future leaders discussions is at the end, uh, have a little bit of a debrief and a talk about what your biggest takeaways were, what you learned the most about, what you're, you're still cur curious and, and learning more about uh, in hopes of you know, inspiring you and, and, and motivating everyone to continue to, to push for finding more knowledge about issues like this and issues that they're interested in. So if anyone has any thoughts they'd just like to share about a certain aspect of this talk that they felt maybe spoke to them more than others or uh, certain kind of lasting lingering questions that you have, feel free. To, to go ahead and raise your hand uh, and, and share them. And, and I'm happy to, to start us off. I think my, my biggest, uh, and again, Andrew, thanks so much for, 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 you know, for, for sharing your thoughts on this. I, I think my biggest interest in, in UNCLOS, and I, I, you may have kind of gotten a glimpse of it because I kept pushing this idea of how it applies to cyber and how it applies to spaces. Really, the, the question of UNCLOS as, as a body of international law that could somehow be applied to, to other spheres. Um, and, and so I, I think that if I, you know, as I continue to, to look at this and, and learn about this, I'm going to be most interested in looking at cyberspace and, and how uh, certain kinds of, of legal frameworks can be applied to that because you know, cyber warfare is a growing, growing aspect of global, global affairs, global politics. And it really isn't, you know, the cyber sphere is not very re regulated as far as spheres go. Um, so so I, just, I just think that understanding on cost to the fullest extent is super, super uh, helpful uh, for running about, or for you know, forging the next, uh, the next kind of uh, similar convention, which our generation may be, may be the generation to do. Um, yeah, does anyone else have any other thoughts to share before I let Andrew give his closing words? Yeah, Greg, go ahead. Yeah, so I think, well, uh, again, first of all, thank you, Andrew, for an uh, amazing presentation um, on UNCLOS. Um, personally, it was a it was an eye opener for me. Um, I again, I've uh, I've had some background on um, uh, cyber litigation, but this was an interesting take from a different perspective. Um, and regarding cyber, like you did a great job referencing it because, I mean, uh, on the example of Russia, they've recently started to transition onto creating a a Russian internet. So that's one that's completely um, separated. Everyone in Russia who accesses the internet is not accessing the same internet Americans are. Uh, it's a completely Russian based internet on Russian servers. So, um, and of course, China has made a huge play for um, enforcing state sovereignty um, in, on the internet. And it's a really interesting discussion on uh, the balance between state sovereignty on the internet and the, the original goal of the internet. Um, so I think, yeah, that was a great connection. And um, I think any future events, that would be a great thing to, to transition to. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, since we got sort of two takeaways about the cyber aspect of it, it's also a, a topic that I'm very interested about myself. Um, for anyone else that's interested on that sort of thing on, you know, sovereignty in cyberspace and potential splitting of cyberspace. There's um, some very interesting academic literature on what is known as the balkanization of the internet. So sort of like, you know, the breaking apart of internets into separate uh, smaller internets and the effect that might have in the long term. Uh, very interesting stuff to read. And if you want a more general overview about the, you know, academic community, intellectual communities perspective on the application of international law to cyberspace and development of international law, um, I can point you towards one publication, the Tallinn Manual, Tallinn as in the capital of Estonia manual, and uh, Tallinn 2.0 are both you know, worthwhile publications to take a look at if you're interested in pursuing that stuff further. For sure. And uh, if no one else has anything they want to share, and do you have any kind of closing words to wrap up our discussion on, on clause in general that, you, that you'd want to throw onto that? Sure, I'll just give a couple words. Um, like I said at the very start, I think on classes, you know, very interesting, um, very fun thing to consider. And I think it has a lot of impact far beyond just the oceans, um, though, you know, it, it, it's something that we'll have to um, deal with for, you know, generations to come. Um, I think our generation's at a very unique point in which um, we're sort of dealing with the, you know, the impacts of past decisions made with regard to UNCLOS, but now we have to, you know, adapt UNCLOS and look at 
uh, and more critically for issues like you know, climate change, for instance, you know, what happens if islands get submerged, um, this sort of thing, and how we can use UNCLOS as a stepping stone um, for the future. So I think it's you know, a, a legal regime that definitely deserves a lot of attention. And I'm, I'm very happy I got to share um, you know, some of this information with all of you. And I hope that more than anything, more than taking away anything specific from you know, what I said that uh, I, I helped you guys you know, find an interest in this and find some footing and going to explore these issues on your own and make your own discoveries. Because uh, I think UNCLOS is some, somewhat like the ocean. It really is a, a huge, vast field for you to you know, explore and discover on your own. So I encourage you all to uh, go and make your own discoveries. Thank you, Andrew. And you know, we're all really thankful for you joining us. And I'm thankful for all of you for being a part of this. Uh, before we take off, uh, those of you who have come to Foreign Affairs and Future Leaders events in the past know that we always love to end our discussions with a group, group photo of those who are comfortable sharing their, sharing their screens and smiling faces. So if you would feel comfortable doing that, feel free to show us your camera and we'll, I'll take a picture. I'll, I'll give you a few seconds to decide whether you want to or not. And before I, before I go ahead and do that. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. I'll give it five more seconds for anyone who wants to be a part of this picture. All right. Okay, four, three, two, one. And I gotta actually do it. <laughs> All right, smile, everyone. One, two. Got it. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to kind of shout out the, the organizations who were involved in this: the United Institute, of course, uh, DP, DPE Fraternity at GW, DP Sorority at GW. If you want to follow us on uh, here, I'm gonna paste it all in the chat. But if you wanna go ahead and follow us on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, if, if you want to reach out to us, I have all the information here uh, and I will paste it right now. There you go. Uh, and yeah, uh, we are really, really glad to have you. We hope that you can come again in the future. Please share our events, share our series, uh, and we're looking forward to seeing you again real soon. But for now, take care, stay safe, and uh, have a great coming week.